With more than 6,000 small and micro-cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple, at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to New Methods in Pain Management, a NobleCon online investor event presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC registered FINRA licensed broker dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. This presentation features Verpax Pharmaceuticals, NASDAQ ticker symbol VRPX. Following a brief overview presentation from Chairman and CEO Anthony Mack, Noble Research Analyst Gregory Arand will moderate a Q&A session. With that, I am pleased to present Anthony Mack. Hello, this is Tony Mack, CEO of Verpax Pharmaceuticals. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm going to uh, go through a presentation where we'll discuss our products pipeline and we'll open it up for questions afterwards. Let's go to slide three. This goes over our mission statement as a company. What we want to do is look at products that are widely used or newly developed products. And we like to put them into our proprietary delivery systems. Our pain products are non-addictive products, but we also have research option agreements to develop our neurology pipeline candidates. We'll talk to you about all of those assets as we go through the presentation. One of the great things about having products like ours is that there are other opportunities for non-dilutive funding. We'll go over those strategies that we have. In fact, we'll talk about one of the grants that we won through the NIH in the presentation. Slide four. This is one of the third party validations that we um, we can attribute our product to as far as our development technology and our non-dilutive um, uh, uh, in-kind grant opportunities. That was with the NIH called NCATS. That award was awarded to us in 2020. We have proceeded with that. We'll go into more details. All of our products have some form of non-dilutive grant opportunities attached to them. We'll learn more about those assets in 2022. This is our franchise pipeline. I'll start with Invelta. Invelta is where we won that NIH grant. This is an encephalin intranasal spray. It's for acute, chronic, and pain associated with cancer. It's an NCE. The pipeline that we have with this product um, is two indications plus a PTSD indication as well. The grant that we won will fund the products all the way through, or the um, acute pain indication and chronic pain indication, all the way through NDA filing, as long as we are successful at each stage. It's an in-kind grant, meaning we do not receive the funding. All of the work is done by the NIH. Currently, that work is being done in the uh, IND enabling phase. So all the IND enabling work is being done currently at the NIH after we receive pre-IND pre guidance from the FDA. We expect all of that work to be done somewhere around the second quarter of 2022. At that point, we'll file the IND and then we'll start with phase one. Epolyderm is our 505B2. It is an accelerated pathway to approval. This particular asset, we've gone twice to the FDA, once for the muscle skeletal pain indication and osteoarthritis. Both are 505B2s. We will complete the IND enabling work in the second quarter of 2022. Charles River is the CRO doing that work. We'll be done with those clinical programs, those preclinical programs, um, in 2022, we'll file the IND, and then we'll go first in humans. Probidor is also a 505B2 for post-operative pain management. That asset, uh, we do not have to do a phase one study. We will go right directly to phase two once we complete the IND enabling work. 
We have extended the timeline on this a little bit. We postponed some of the IND enable work in order to extend the patents on this asset. That will allow us more efficient manufacturing and may be able to extend the um, duration of the asset. We expect, however, to finish the IND enabling work sometime at the end of the fourth quarter of 2022 and go into first in humans in the phase two study sometime in the second quarter of 2023. Ancular is our high density molecular mask. It's an antiviral, and it also demonstrated that it reduces viral load to the brain. Now, this particular asset is our delivery platform that we use to deliver the enkephalin, the product that I discussed earlier. That product, we use that, that molecular envelope technology pr to protect the enkephalin. I'll get more into detail on that as we go through the presentation. So this is not, Ancular is not an active, it's actually the delivery platform. When we studied it in in vitro, ex vivo, and in vivo trials, we discovered that it was able to stop the replication of influenza and SARS. Now, that, that ex vivo study was at the request of BARDA. As I, as I said, all of our assets, we look for non-dilutive funding strategies. The in vivo data that was recently published also demonstrated that when we dissected the rats, that there was no virus in the brain. We took all of those studies that I just mentioned, plus our 28-day tox study, as well as our stability data, plus 18 months, and presented that to the FDA. Um, not knowing it would be an OTC, um, we learned that it was being reviewed by the non-prescription division. And when we received notice on the 11th of August, we indeed learned in the written response that it would be an OTC asset. Since that time, you've seen press releases on us moving forward with as much work as we can as far as even, even uh, engaging a manufacturer for this asset. We will uh, complete the rest of the IND enabling studies as soon as we can. We're hoping sometime in this, um, uh, this year, uh, before the end of this year, if we are able to successfully get that done, we will go first in humans in Australia. What we want to do here is get as much data as we can before we open up the IND in the United States. So we'd have all of the data that I just mentioned, all of the IND enabling work, plus first in human data that we would present to the FDA in hopes that we can apply for an emergency use authorization with this asset. Now that's not promise, but that is our strategy with Ancular. The latest product, again, is our using our molecular envelope technology is with the VRP324. The indication would be for epilepsy, a rare pediatric disease. Now, we take these assets, and as I say, if we can deliver them more efficiently, which we believe we can. With this asset, we would have a product that would be able to deliver at a fraction of what's being delivered currently in the product called the Epold Dialex, which is a used to be a GW Pharma product before they sold it to Jazz Pharmaceuticals for an excess of $7 billion. We also, because we're nose to brain, would also be able to bypass the, uh, the liver. So unlike the Epodialex, we will not have to be metabolized in the liver, hence no drug-drug interaction. This is just a slide going over each of the products. And so as I go through them, think anytime I mention the um, spray film um, technology, it's going to be like a topical patch formulation or a, a cream or a gel. Think of those things except more efficient. Um, nose to brain is going to be our intranasal asset. Right now, we talk about encephalins in the assets that I talked to you about. When we talk about Providor, we're talking about post-op pain. I'll mention hydrogel and why that's so important with this formulation. Slide seven, um, here, just go look at the total marketplace. And this is just US. In Velta, $7 billion when you look at addressable market. Epoloderm, 3.3 billion. Probidor, almost $600 million. The lion's share of this market is owned by a company called Pacera. Their product is Expro. They do over $400 million in this marketplace and they have a $2.5 billion market cap. 
we have head-to-head -head studies in our animal models that show that we're superior to this product. And uh, we'll go over that in the presentation. Slide eight, one of the things I wanna point out to here is that we have global rights to our pain assets and that we, we are looking for ex-US partners. Again, a non, another non-dilutive funding strategy that we have. Um, when we look at this one here, what we decided to do was engage a group called Terea Capital. Terea Capital is a global partner um, for us to help us with global partnering strategies and some of the US strategies as far as partnering and sub-licensing our assets. Invelta, I'll start here. Let's go to slide 10. Let's talk about Invelta, our encephalins uh, that are in these assets. Now, encephalins are naturally occurring analgesics in the body. Um, they attach to what's called the delta receptors. They would, if they could attach to the delta receptors, block pain, similar to a mu receptor agonist. And they would do it without the side effects associated with mu receptor agonists, like respiratory depression, drug seeking, and drug tolerance. Uh, and cephalins, however, biodegrade because they can't get past the blood brain barrier. Hence, our delivery technology has solved that. In our animal studies, if you look to your right, you'll see an illustration. We use a device here. If you open up the device, there's a cartridge that would go in there. There are two chambers in that cartridge. One would have the inert gas and one would have the active. That active would encompass the encephalin along with the nanoparticles and that molecular envelope technology that I talked about earlier. And as soon as you engage this, you don't have to inhale it. As soon as you engage the device, the inner gas would develop a plume and it would start to deliver it. And then the nanoparticles would help to get past the blood brain barrier and the molecular envelope technology is there to protect it from biodegrading long enough to attach to the delta receptors. Once they do that in our animal models, we demonstrated that our Envelta controlled pain very similar to morphine when it came to moderate to severe pain without the opioid side effects of mu receptors like respiratory depression, drug seeking, drug tolerance, and constipation. We do have patents on all of our technologies and we will continue to put a patent strategy around these assets, extending them or adding more um, uh, in the way of IP around all of the assets. Ancular. Ancular is our intranasal um, asset. Again, this is with that molecular envelope technology. We discovered that is going to be reviewed by the non-prescription division. 13.6, 13.1 billion dollar market um, when you look at this market in the antiviral OTC marketplace. This is going to be a quick description of how this product worked, how it was able to block the replication of SARS and influenza in the studies that I'd mentioned, the preclinical studies. Ancular is a GCPQ formulation and is highly related to quinary modium chytosans, which are very positively charged molecules. Viruses like the coronavirus and influenza are very negatively charged. Ancular is a chytosam derivative of the QAC, and it has two effects. One effect is that it is vericidal. The other one is that it prevents the entry um, of the um, virus to the cell via the ACE2 receptor. If you look at the illustration to your right and you start with that first graph, it gives you a really good description of what the SARS um, COVID looks like with the spike protein. Beneath there, you'll see that H2 receptor, and then you'll see the nasal epithelial cell. Second, second illustration, you'll see again what happens with the spike protein when they do attach to that H2 receptor. It then becomes a host in the epithelial cell and it starts to replicate. Now, the third one is we are studying this asset to be a prophylactic. In other words, it would be used first. It also has a really long nasal presence. So we know that it lasts plus 24 hours. So we're studying as a once daily. When we introduce the GPCQ in our animal models and in our mucosal and in our in vitro, 
and then we introduce the virus, the virus is attracted to this negative, to this positively charged molecule. And it just goes to it. And what happens is the, um, the GPCQ surrounds it and it's mucoadhesive, so it's sticky when it gets on these molecules and it cannot attach to the H2 receptors. And because it can't replicate at that point, it actually starts to kill the virus. So that's it for this particular asset. We do have technology um, uh, patents that take us out to 2041. We will look to extend those patents, as I said before. Huge market opportunity when we look at anti-vaxxers, transplants, Im immunocompromised patients, first responders, uh, DOD and military, uh, public transportation and public events. We do have a strategy, however, that um, encompasses a little bit different strategy we have with our other assets in that we're willing here to look at U.S. partners for uh, joint ventures, co-promote or divestitures with this particular asset. Uh, Epoliderm. Epoliderm, let's go to the next slide here to get us through here. This is going to be, um, this is our spray film technology. Uh, think of a inhaler when you think of meter dosing, um, you would know the exact dose that's coming out. Think of a liquid Band-Aid as far as going onto the skin, but much thinner when it goes onto the skin. Drying time is 60 to 90 seconds. As I said, this product can go on any active joint. You're not concerned with tape reinforcement as you are with a hydrogel patch. Um, you're not concerned with touching it or putting it on your hands like you would do with another gel cream. It comes right out of the can. Uh, when it goes onto the can, it dries, it goes through the skin, and it penetrates the skin, no different than any topical or transdermal asset. Slide 21 just shows you, again, our proof of concept. What we do before we uh, in license an asset is we like to find out, first of all, is it compatible to what is on the market now? This is an ex vivo model using um, skin from abdominal plasty. Uh, and we compared it to the flector patch, which is already approved for muscle skeletal pain. And as you can see here, there's comparable skin absorption. Probidor. Probidor is um, the post-operative pain asset. Uh, I like to uh, get right into it here with this particular slide here to demonstrate to you our pig wound model. When we did our head-to-head -head studies versus Expril, which is the Pacera asset, and versus the free bupivacaine, which is your generic version of bupivacaine versus placebo. As you can see, the dark blue line is our Invelta asset. And then the sky blue line is another formulation of our Invelta asset. Of course, we selected the, um, the dark blue. The gray is Pacera and um, Pacera's Expril. And the uh, red is the free bupivacaine and the placebo is the black. This pig wound model, you'll see to your left of the graph, there's a G-force model there. That G-force model is the amount of pressure that we can put on the wound of the pig before the pig feels the pain. As you can see here, G-forces of 60 uh, were achieved with this asset, but never below 20 on this asset throughout 96 hours of, this, of, of, of doing this G-force exercise. We actually stopped the protocol at 96. As you look over at the gray, it starts to dip below 20 on the G-force and then significantly drops off after that. Why is that? Because the liposomes do not stay at the womb site. They tend to stay in the body to give duration in the body for 72 hours, but they don't give pain control at the site for that time. This formulation is set up so that it can stay there. Remember I mentioned hydrogel. When we draw it up in the syringe, no different than Expril or free bupivacaine. But once it gets into the womb, it turns sticky and it keeps the liposomes from migrating away from the site. Hence, we get 96 hours of pain control. We presented this, of course, to the FDA in the pre-IND meeting. And what we were told is that we would get a claim if we can demonstrate that we're using significantly less opioid over the first 72 hours. We would get what would be an opioid sparing label. Next is our team. Uh, most of us have been together for quite a long time, but you can see the backgrounds of our team when you're looking through here. You can see our board as far as our board is concerned. 
um, who, who really play a significant part in our team and helping us make decisions. I would say Eric Floyd is our big regulatory expert. He has probably at least 30 to 35 product approvals with the pain division and in rare disease. I'll stop there to see if there's any questions and then open it up for Q&A with Greg. Greg Arrand at Noble Capital Markets, Senior Analyst. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, really helpful. I, I love the technology. Um, you covered a, a number of different things in terms of pipeline. And I noticed in terms of your pain products, uh, in terms of looking at it, um, in terms of timeline and some of the funding, can you address the differences in those pipeline pathways? I think, you know, you got a new chemical entity uh, you've got the 505B2 pathways. Can you just help investors and, and myself understand that a little bit better in terms of how much time it takes? Uh, and you talked about IND into next year, where that fits for those three pain products. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, so as you know, we just completed a, a raise. And so the two 505B2s, Epolidurm and Probidor, we expect that we would file NDAs on those two assets. Um, uh, by the end of 2024. Uh, the other two assets is um, they are the NCEs. We're hoping again for that EUA with the Ancular asset. Um, but if um, that uh, doesn't, that we'll have to continue to do those studies. Uh, we're of course going to look for partnerships with that particular asset. Um, when we talk about the Invelta asset, uh, that asset is being funded by a grant. So uh, we will proceed with that grant uh, throughout the development of this particular asset. Now we're responsible for any of the regulatory uh, things that need to be done, such as filing the INDs and NDAs, but we expect that we would at least be in the phase two at the end of our runway, which is around 2024 with that the asset as well. Uh, now the, the, the newest asset that we have there, we expect that we would be applying for grants with that asset. There is a rare disease division with the NIH that we have identified that we believe would help us or assist with grant opportunities for, for that asset, looking at the uh, clear attributes that we have over what exists now in the marketplace to treat epilepsy in pediatrics. Um, you touched on this all, also in terms of the NCATs, uh, the funding, the whole program uh, with the NIH. Um, what, what's the benefit to the company? Is it, is it strictly cost savings? Does it help you move the needle, so to speak, on the product? Uh, what's the benefits there? Yes. You know, um, when we look at that asset, again, it's, it's a huge project. If you look at the value that that asset has as far as what it would cost to get an NC through development, you're looking at probably somewhere around 96 to $100 million. So it's a huge benefit for us to get a product like that through uh, the process with grants and assistance. Now, our 505P2s don't come with that kind of ticket, um, but we still apply for grants for them. They're like 10 to $15 million to get through development. But we still, again, have some non-diluted funding strategies, not as lucrative as that one, but nonetheless, um, they are applications that have gone in. We have a whole team that we put together around the grants. Um, it's it's, a, it's an acquired taste, so to speak. So we do have a grant writer, a grant compliance officer. Uh, we didn't highlight in the in the slide, but Sheila Mathias heads up our regulatory and the grant strategy process, along with Matt Barnes, our portfolio manager. You, you mentioned also uh, regarding the, the NIH uh, program that uh, it, it, it gets you into different indications possibly. And I think cancer pain was one that came out of this, if I'm not mistaken. Are there other ones that you can talk about or would like to talk about? Yes. So um, what's unique about that asset is, again, the grant is covering the IND enabling work and the phase one work as long as we're successful. Um, so we can then reference the IND and the phase one for the cancer pain indication. We can also reference it for the PTSD indication. So that would be, uh, again, we, you, we can use the grant and reference that before we would get into other strategies. Now, for the PTSD, we would definitely look at grant opportunities. Uh, for the cancer pain indication, we would also, we may be even able to reference the phase two from that grant when we look at the cancer pain indication. So um, again, we're always looking to try to save money where we can and, and try to piggyback off of things that we're already doing. Probador, you're, you're injectable for um, uh, post-operative pain. You mentioned that it's kind of, kind of stalled or just stopped or paused, I guess. is I'm not sure the exact terminology, but it's sort of slowed down a bit because you're trying to extend the patents on it. Can you explain that a little bit better, too? 
Yeah, so what we saw is an opportunity here to extend the patents out another five to 10 years, and we only delay in the development maybe another four to six months. Um, as you could see in the protocol, we stopped the study at 96 hours. We believe that it actually could go out longer, probably another seven days, another three days, right? So possibly even longer than that. So we want to find out what that looks like. We also have built in some more um, efficiencies in the manufacturing that would drive down our cost of goods and open it up for us as far as looking at manufacturing partners. So that four to six month delay we thought was worth it. Hmm. Sounds like that sounds like a good idea. Um, just moving outside the pain management area just for a bit. Uh, you talk about Ancular, your for antivirals. You mentioned influenza and SARS. Does it have applications for almost all types of viral uh, issues? We believe that when we look at viruses, as you heard me point out, they're very negatively charged. And if what we saw in those studies hold up, we do think it could be an antiviral that could be studied in other things. Now, this wasn't something that we were looking for. It's just something that our scientists thought would work. And they applied it and saw that, hey, they just attracted to this, this uh, Imodium chitosam, so to speak, and um, it kills it. It gets on it and it kills the virus. Now, it could be have other applications. We're going to file additional patents on it as well. We're at 2041. But again, the uh, antiviral brain load is also another indication that this could possibly have. And that has a lot to do with the long COVID or symptoms when these viruses get into the brain, when you can't taste anymore, you get brain fog. If this is something that could prevent that along with other therapies, um, this, this, that could have another application to it. We would apply for a grant for that second indication. For sure. Sure. Um, in terms of this is probably long game, but in terms of potential manufacturing processes, um, you secured some uh, agreements, I think, up front here. But what's the what's the uh, downside to the manufacturing? Are there any difficulties you see in terms of doing this uh, on a mass scale for any of the product candidates? I, I think that if we the, the one that is the the most difficult, and that's why we again look to extend the patents and build more efficiencies, would be in the aseptic area, and that would be with the probidor asset. Um, that would be the one that be most challenging to find a good aseptic facility. Uh, but by by enhancing the formulation and changing it up a bit, we open it up to more of those manufacturers. But the other assets, no. The other assets, um, as you saw probably in a press release, we secured sequins for our um, our molecular envelope technology. They're backed by a company called Bain Capital. Excellent, um, excellent group, and they have 24 facilities throughout the world. So uh, we're excited about the partnership with uh, sequins. Excellent. That was great. Um, you, you mentioned, I think, also that you recently raised about $40 million um, in an offering. Um, where's that money going to go? Uh, what what product candidates uh, are going to be used? And I mean, where that funding will go for those candidates and how long do you think the money will last? Yes. Yeah, so the money we, we project will take us out to 2024, uh, December 2024. It, we're going to use some of that funding uh, to help us with the regulatory requirements that we have to do within Delta. We don't, we don't have to do anything else, but just make sure we get in front of the FDA when we need to. Um, but for our two 505B2s, we're going to make sure that that takes us all the way through NDA filing. So that money takes us all the way through NDA filing with that asset. We will use some of that funding to get us to the strategy that I talked to you about with Ancular, where we apply for the EUA. And that's our strategy moving forward. But post that, everything with that product will be grant driven. Uh, if we don't get the EUA, we'll apply for grants. And with the new asset, we see that as a grant opportunity as well. We've already had discussions with some of the divisions in the NIH, as well as BARDA and the DOD, as far as strategy when we move forward with those assets. You talked about too some recent uh, rights that you um, garnered in terms of the products in cannabinoid epilepsy uh, for for adults and, ch and children, or is it just for children? Uh, yes, well, so we had the rights for adults and children, but the strategy here is to go with the rare disease in children first. Okay. That's where the grant opportunities are, and it actually allows us to really kind of accelerate our, our our path to approval because you'd have to there's less people you have to have in the studies, less costly. Um, so um, so that's the first strategy uh, to move forward with the rare disease in children first. And I, I noticed there's a, the, the nasal delivery mechanism seems to have wide applications, and, and epilepsy seems to be now another leg in the stool, so to speak. Do you, 
expect to see other candidates uh, acquired uh, in other indications beyond rare disease or pain or whatever the case may be? Without giving away any secrets. Um, <laughs> Without giving away secrets, yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. When you look at nose to brain therapy, um, when you look at this molecular envelope technology, it does have other applications. Um, uh, so yes, we do see it um, as uh, something that could potentially look at products that we would be able to benefit from with less dosing. So when we look at the uh, CBD asset, we're talking about we have a fraction of the dose to get the same benefit of a product that already exists with a pretty good market share. Uh, we're also talking about an asset that could go through um, the body without being metabolized in the liver, so no drug-drug interaction. And again, this asset would not probably be affected as much by, uh, by a high fat meal as you would with a product that had, um, uh, like you have with the Epidiolex. Um, are there anything else? Anything else? Uh, again, I mentioned uh, other indications, but what potentially would attract or, or pique your interest in terms of utilizing some of the delivery mechanisms you have currently uh, without, again, without giving away this, this, the story, yeah, but yeah. is there something you can actually uh, refer to in terms of potential interest for this company? Because it seems like, again, you've got some pretty wide dynamics here in terms of applications. Yeah, yeah, we, we, I can talk about one thing because it's in the S1, <laughs> and that is that with the uh, spray film technology, it's not just topical, it's also transdermal. So what we did is we secured a research option agreement for ADHD um, with the methylphenidate, with tigotine, when we talk about restless leg syndrome and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, when you talk about Alzheimer's and dementia with the river stigma assets. So we have the right of first refusal uh, with those assets and we would look to uh, develop them at some time uh, in the future when when uh, we, we get some wins with what we have now and in our pipeline. Excellent, yeah, you have a pretty full pipeline and certainly yeah. at this point in time, I, I, you should be proud of uh, what you've achieved in a relatively short time. You just came public earlier this year, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. That's so correct. That's come correct. a long way. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that's all the questions that I can uh, come up with uh, that were needed to be addressed. If there's anything else you can uh, mention that you'd like to in closing thoughts, I'd welcome that. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't get a chance to go over our team that you have, but if you look at the team that we have built around us, our board members that we have, uh, we have a team that's set up to take products from the time of inception all the way through the clinical development when you doc looked at Dr. Jeff Gooden, all the way to commercialization when you look at Gerald Bruce on the team itself. Um, uh, when you look at our board members, are very active. You have two board certified anesthesiologists in pain. You have you have in the way of academia with um, uh, our folks uh, with Tani Jungalingam, and um, you have two guys that keep us financially secure with um, our, our two uh, finance folks. So we we have a well rounded board, very active board. Um, and you talk about what we've been able to achieve. We've been able to achieve that because we have good people around us that are able to assess products. We don't bring anything into the pipeline unless we can really find a real good advantage. That could be a cost advantage. That could be a health economics advantage. But we're always looking to bring assets in that we can find clear advantages over the competitors, whether it be in a branded or generic marketplace. Excellent. Excellent. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for this NobleCon online investor event presentation brought to you by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Visit our YouTube channel for more video content, including interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and micro cap companies listed.